I've been asked to uh, come and be the person who knows the least about this important conversation, and it is a privilege to be asked to do that. Um, thank you uh, for the karakia, for setting us on a pathway of understanding that there will be lots of conversation coming from lots of different directions and some hard things for us to work through. But that is, that is what we're here to do today, and uh, we have an absolutely awesome group of people here. So I'm going to start by simply asking our awesome people to inter introduce themselves. So can I hear to you? Yeah, I'm Kira Tato for Felicity Foy Tapuangwa. Uh, I'm the representative for the Chapu area as an elected member and have a background in town planning and also have grown up on a farm and spent a lot of time in Tapu or Teka, um, in my view, the best place in the whole of, the, of our country, not the world. Kia ora tato, ko niko ora toku inoa. I'm the ecologist who's been managing the mapping and assessment of the SNA project since um, early 2019. <laughs> I've also been doing this for both Kaura and uh, Pongarei districts as well. Kia ora, my name is Greg Wilson. I'm the manager of district planning and we have the responsibility of updating our district plan and making sure it's achieving its work. Hi, I'm Emily Robertson. I'm a policy planner in the district plan team. I lead the Indigenous Biodiversity Portfolio and I've been project managing the SNA mapping. I'm uh, Kira Koto. My name is Johanna Linden. Um, I am co chair of Whangarua Moyotama Trust, uh, an Ahi Whenua Trust uh, under the Ture Whenua Māori in the northern part of Whangaruru and also CEO of Ngāti Wai Trust Board. Uh, I'm actually was found out I wasn't coming here today, today. Um, so back at home when we received these SNAs, we've had a lot of discussions around the SNAs, and so um, it's kind of leads to two areas that. Um, I agreed to come and talk to or ask some questions about today. We have concerns about the process mainly. So um, I'm coming from out of Whangaroa and I acknowledge the home people here that we're on their whenua and we're talking and um, discussing these issues today. This morning of Frances to be a support person for her. Um, I am the founding uh, director of Rangatahi Uraroa, which is the Rangatahi Development Unit for Māori and Whangaroa. It was created out of the need um, to combat the suicide statistics within our region. Um, I also am the facilitator for the Whangaroa Kaio Community ECNA Hui, which happened last Thursday, of which 200 plus people attended. Um, so I do sit here with interest on this table today, both for Rangatahi Voice and for our wider Whangaroa community. Um, my name is Ryan Fredrickson. I am a member of Ngāti Rā Mahoe. The hapa that resides are uh, Manamora, Manapenua, off the east coast of Wanu and Mahanapua, Kaina. Uh, plus, one thing that I do is Del Pano, is now I'm a trustee with Pangaroa Papahapu, working with our treaty plans. Um, also with the MAPA claims on behalf of our own hapu. Uh, I am a trustee of Wanu uh, Chi Chi Chi, which has been slept with us in name. And that one is particularly high buying that the chair or secretary wasn't notified. Um, and perhaps at right this moment is that I find it rather ironic 
that should have left this consultation right to the last week. Perhaps we wouldn't have needed to arise a lot more than we've had to do with very little resource, but it's been enough to awaken Māori and Whangaroa mm -hmm. and certainly in the light of Tautukura. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I look forward to someone accepting that online petition and hard copy on June the mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, kia ora tato, Darren Edwards. I'm the General Manager of Strategic Planning and Policy here at Farmers District Council. I work very closely with Greek teams and members. Um, my name is Teresa Birkhart. I'm a policy planner in the um, Greek District Planning Team's um, MA. Um, my focus on the plan is on the time of the the plan, which is on the entire plan. Uh, Kia ora uh, Andrew uh, Kimball for Greenwater. Um, we're here today wearing a few hats. Um, firstly, representing a Tuanatoku Hokianga Trust. We have uh, around 2,600 uh, shareholders and many thousands of beneficiaries. So, firstly, representing those interests at Miti Miti and also at Ofata near uh, Hurricane Harbour. Um, also, um, a beneficiary to Wairau Trust, um, who also has many thousands of um, beneficiaries. Uh, both Ahu Whenua Trusts, also as a trustee and a beneficiary of our family trust, which has the significant land holdings on the uh, coast of Miti Miti, which is captured within the SNAs. Um, and also as a hapu member of uh, Hokianga, uh, 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 Te Rāna Waki Hokianga Ngā Hapu, I just want to represent the interests of our Ngā Hapu today. And just wanted to make a point also that, um, uh, from our point of view, that uh, today isn't a consultation, I just want to make that, that point. Um, but we've agreed to, to engage in this process. I think it's a good process and conversation here. So, good luck. Thank you. Kia ora koutou, uh, Ben Lee um, from the North Regional Council, and I look after the planning and policy team. Kia ora koutou, Kelly Stratford, Tōku Ingoa, and my farm of District Councillor, and uh, Marae Kamati member for Waikani Marae, and uh, shareholder of Hi, uh, Kyoto Koto. I'm David Clendon. I'm a farmer of district councillor for Bay of Islands, Tongaro. I'm based in Kerikey. Yeah, good day. I'm Dave Wilson, um, beef farmer in um, Wairahu. Rahu. Um, yeah, I'm representing Federated Farmers and I've worked as an ecologist in the past. Uh, kia ora, I'm uh, Sean, Sean Clark. I'm a family of fifth, fifth generation sheep farmers from Canterbury. I joined, uh, I, I married into West Coast Iwi in 30 years ago. Um, my bride and I travelled broadly with Defence and we came home four years ago, where I'm now the CEO of the Farm Office. Thank you. I think the important thing today is that we're not here to it is intended as a kōri kōri rō. And um, what we're going to be encouraging is the diversity of, of views to come to the table, to be aired, um, to raise issues, and to generally participate in that framework. Um, at the end of the day, there's a lot more decisions that will have to be made, but that isn't today. That is not the purpose of this conversation. Um, I'd like to think that when we're thinking about environmental issues, we're all in agreement broadly that we need to look after Kapatuan and that we need to make sure that things are sustained for the future. And we all face major challenges with climate change and all the other things that are happening. So uh, I invite you to open your hearts, bring heartfelt conversation to this today. And um, to start us off, I would like to invite Sean just to give us that overview context of um, what it is that this is important and why, how it's come to be. Uh, thank you. Inga rangi tēra tēnā koutou e te whanau o te kaunihere tēnā koutou e ngā tangata o ngā hua wha tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. And I just want to take a moment to welcome you here for those who are in person. And for the 156 people who are watching online right now, and if I could appeal to this table and to everyone who's watching online, this is recorded and 
we really would be relying on word of mouth for whatever happens in the next couple of hours to be shared with anyone who you're talking to at the church or at the pub um, so that we can get the word out on, on what this thing is and how it's supposed to be working and how it's not working. The bigger the corridor, the better uh, in, our, in our cool piece of democracy up here. If I could just start just with a situation as, as we thought it simply existed, and we've certainly had our eyes wide open uh, with the amount of public discourse that now exists on this. In brief, the Resource Management Act is a statutory requirement, no flexibility, to understand, identify uh, our biodiversity in New Zealand and to consider how to protect it. That's a long-standing act uh, over years or decades. So every now and then, much shorter frequency, the government puts out a, under the RMA, a national policy statement, and it gives voice to that act for now and says what we need to do about it in the moment. There's a response at the regional level. So all the regions, all the regional councils of New Zealand then respond to that, and they write a regional policy statement. RMA, national policy statement, regional policy statement. And then that policy statement, it gets down, to, starts getting down to a bit of nitty gritty, like it'll say um, that a bog is not a bog for protecting if it's less than 0.2 of a hectare, but it is if it's more than 0.2 of a hectare, and a lot more to boot. And then down at the bottom of the pecking order is where it comes home to districts like this. And we simply pick up our writing instructions and we sit down with uh, the best consultants we can find and Nick will have to defend his own credentials, but uh, you need highly trained ecologists who can do this at least. And there'll be others that maybe should have been at the room. Let's talk about that later. But at the moment, uh, those ecologists have simply sat down with what already existed as protected natural areas. Secondly, some new photos, because we had an aircraft look really closely at our soil types and our Cody dieback and everything else they could map about our, our region so that we understood it better. And now that we've got a better idea of where our different uh, trees and flora and fauna are, and they simply, on the map, refreshed what already existed and drew some new red lines around all the areas that we thought were sensitive. And as, the, as a result, um, what was um, understood to be our sensitive areas have been updated. And what we do with that is um, make sure everyone's OK with it, which is what we've started now in a multiple stage consultation to, to get feedback, as we are currently getting plenty of. And the effect of this, to finish, the effect of mapping your sensitive natural areas is that, or significant natural areas, is that, um, well, um, nothing changes. Everyone continues to use their land as they have been. But if they wanted to build a, a, a six-storey backpackers or a subdivision, then we'd expect that to have ordinarily involved a resource consent. Uh, within the suite of things that get looked at, there's one extra consideration. And that is, is it a significant natural area? And that too would also have to be looked at before it was decided on whether this particular proposal from the owner could go ahead or not. And that's what we thought was happening, and that's what we're in the middle of now. And we are at the beginning of a consultation process and hearing a great deal, a deal of discourse. And I'm, I know I'm going to learn some things at the table today, as I, as my employers, the, the, the elected members here, will. So we, uh, I just want you to know that we are really big ears for what's about to happen. Uh, and I look forward to a civil conversation that lots of witnesses can benefit from in what will be not the end of this conversation, but I assure you that, you know, the beginning of something that's going to be on, ongoing. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. And um, just to make that point very clear, our, our online audience are also able to put in questions. Um, so we're hoping for lots of questions from our online uh, people as well. But to start us off, um, Andrew, you've put in a couple of questions. Would 
would you like to um, repeat those questions so the online people know exactly what those questions are? And then whoever you want to direct it, your question to. Anyone can have a conversation. Sure, thank you. Just, just before I ask um, the question, I want to give you a little bit of background. Um, it's my understanding and our understanding of the making of what we've gone through since these um, notifications came out. And certainly, um, from, our, from our perspective, um, we see that these uh, proposed measures, um, well, we agree with the, uh, the protection of, protection of, uh, of uh, sensitive uh, flora and fauna which we believe we've been doing for years anyway. Um, but we believe that this is actually, for our house, is a direct attack on our rangatiratanga of our whenua, a direct uh, attack on our uh, kaitiakitanga, a direct attack on our mātauranga, uh, a direct attack on our physical, spiritual and cultural well-being. I just wanted to make those points because that's at the core of where we're coming from and drives our decisions and, and our actions of where we want to go forward. So, um, just moving uh, on to my questions. Um, so, in light, I guess there's been a lot of discourse over the last um, uh, week or so, and, and I guess that discourse has had to be built up in quite a short time. And I think that is again part of the issues that we've had is the amount of time frame we've had to respond. But um, in light of that, also, uh, Minister Shaw's comments last week. Um, question, I guess, is to regional council and, and district council, um, where he was talking about potentially putting the process on hold. Uh, how does, what's the, uh, uh, potentially due to the, the trouble that's happening at North, using this words, the trouble that was going on at North, um, how, is the, uh, the, how are the councils going to approach that, um, those comments on putting this process on Taihoi, as he puts it, uh, Taihoi in this process? Uh, that was the first question. Second one was, uh, in terms of biodiversity, um, apart from uh, the proposed DCNAs, apart from removing uh, landowner rights, what other plans are there to protect um, uh, biodiversity? Because, you know, we know um, on our dock estates and areas that they have trouble managing what's already there. And, um, you know, so are there plans to do that? And I guess from our perspective, you know, the way we look at it is probably better to incentivise um, have a mission to incentivise our protection of these areas rather than draconian rules made over the top of us, as I say, and, uh, with the other concerns that we have. Um, so those questions can probably go to, to representatives of both councils, I guess. Go on. Do any of the elected members like to talk about the Mayor's approaches to Wellington? Sure. Yeah, Kia ora, Andrew, for the questions and for framing that group power call on like background commentary. It's really useful to hear that directly. We have been hearing a great deal of feedback, as I'm sure you're all aware. My email inbox is just about exploding, and that's a good thing. Um, I appreciate your comment that I think the attention lying behind this is indeed benign. It is about protection of habitat, because without habitat, our species, no matter how resilient, cannot survive. They need somewhere to live, somewhere to breed, somewhere to feed. And Te Ao Pākehā, Te Ao Māori, will understand that very well, I think. Clearly, this has not worked well in this process. Um, for the Council, um, it's a task we have kind of given, where we're obliged to go through this. But clearly, we have now hit a significant road, um, a bump in the road. And our response to that, I was speaking to the Mayor this morning, who was engaging directly with the Minister James Shaw and also with Willie Jackson, who carries, I think, an associate minister role with responsibility for Māori land. Um, it is the view, uh, we haven't come to a firm decision, but I think the, the way the council laws are moving is certainly the full title on this. It is part of our district plan process, which has explained the timing, but we do need to recognise we're simply going to have to put that to one side, get on with our district plan review, which obviously is a function again, which we're that's a statutory requirement where that's done by a certain date. This will need to be a special project. And frankly, given the level of public interest and the depth of, of significant feeling and pretty genuine concerns that have been expressed, we're going to need resources to do that. And part of the Mayor's um, cordero with Wellington will be that we don't have the resource and it's unreasonable to put the cost of building that resource onto our farmers rate payers, when in a sense, for once, Farmers District is overachieving. We're kind of head of the game. 
we hope to do that more often, of course. But seriously, it is a matter, really, we need to speak to Wellington very clearly, and the Mayor is doing that, to say, OK, this is something which is obviously not going to fly with our, um, with our Māori landholders or indeed our Pākehā um, ratepayers and, and citizens. So we need some time to get on with this and the resource to deal with. Um, that's probably enough for me. Thank you. Thank you. Is, is there anyone else who wants to talk to the first part of the question oh, of time? I could, and Greg was probably going to say it, but once the, if the NPS is uh, implemented in July, um, Council has time to give effect to that. Usually they do it, you know, give us like six or seven years anyway, so we don't need to rush. Thanks very much, Kelly. And I can make a brief response to these issues. Um, when we made the district plan, it's a participatory process. Um, we've been developing a new district plan since 2016 as a consolidated review. So it's a whole whole district plan that we're changing. And when we do that, we need to take heed of other plans and policies that sit above us. So we make sure that it's integrated, it's representing those higher order directions. Um, and so we have been doing that, giving effect to um, a regional direction that and um, Indigenous biodiversity is, is identified as a, a matter for our region and um, there's methods and policies identified to, to manage those. In the background, we know that a, a national direction is also being formulated. So in a sense, we're working in two parallel universes. We're chasing down one and we're seeing another direction being formulated. Now, if that national direction were to be um, implemented July. Um, we're hearing more recently at the end of this year. Um, it does give council this, this chance to, to understand what does that mean? Um, how do we give effect to these higher order documents appropriately? And um, the national direction offers not just outcomes, but a very strong process to get to those outcomes and um, with a longer time frame as well. So, yeah. Some, some Can I ask a supplementary question to Andrew? Um, around timing. Why is Farmers District Council choosing to be the first in Taitokiro? Why, why did you do that? Thanks for that. And um, probably within that question, which I waffled on a bit, so I apologise, um, we have been chasing down the regional direction. So take away the national direction altogether, we're still on a particular pathway. The national direction is being formulated, but it hasn't been, it's, it's been draft and it's been subject to further change. Yes, I submitted on it. <laughs> and as submitters, we haven't heard anything about no. it. I think maybe it, it's a complex issue for the whole country. Obviously, it's a really tough one for us. Um, and so perhaps there's a clue in that it's taken so long because they're trying to find the right balance. So why did Farmers District Council choose to uh, come out in May this year and consult on ECNAs? Why are you the first in Taitokiro? Why did you do that? Sure. And in fact, we've been developing the draft district plan for a couple of years, and we, we came in our district in 2018 and 2019 and had face-to-face -face and pops up pop-ups with a draft policy framework that identified this is this is something that we're we're pursuing because it's been identified in a higher order document, a regional document for us to Maybe manage. Maybe your pop-ups we just missed the memo that SNOs were coming. Perhaps yes. it's an so engagement file. As a councillor, um, we got to decide to, you know, do the engagement on the SNAs, but I did not realise the full ramifications of it. Although I, um, when I followed what the NPS consultation was like, um, it went for what, nine months. But for the impacts that it was going to have for our our region, not just the far north. It was so great that I felt we needed to like and we needed to rip the band-aid off. And it it's it's caused a lot of aru aru. We just celebrated Māori Awards and we didn't have SNAs and it was like, oh way to go. Poor relationships. Can I just ask through the facilitator, Greg, can you just answer Hiana's question? Can you talk about the the regional policy statement and how much time we've got to respond to it? Yeah, um, thanks. Um, the regional policy statement was created in May 2016, and um, it set out a number of policies that um, 
district councils need to be effective in, in our plan making. Um, so there's cycles, if you like, of looking at the higher order documents and making sure that we can represent that in the way that um, is appropriate for our communities. And it's a public process. Um, so we have a draft district plan now available. The fact that we moved around our district in March for, for, for a month with that draft. But within the draft, there's lots of changes, and this is one of those elements. That so how long have we got from May 16 to a um, Our aim was to notify our proposed plan by the end of this year. There's other regulatory change happening around us. Um, and also, in the background, there's the repeal and replacement of the Resource Management Act. So this, this plan-making process is perhaps the last opportunity for communities to have a really good say in the last district plans that then get um, absorbed into a new process um, under new legislation. Can I just um, pick up, sorry, you had a question and then sort of pick up something else that was part of Andrew's questions, didn't you? Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to raise that um, a lot of what we're hearing is frustration and I think it's the cumulative regulatory framework that we're working under from central government and district councils, regional councils and messenger. Um, we currently have a lot of, we already have protection mechanisms in our district plan, um, chapter 12 of our district plan. We've got higher um, levels that we need to meet from the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement with coastal areas. So there already is framework for protection of Indigenous biodiversity in terms of our Indigenous fauna. And so I think people are asking, why do we need more? You know, how is this going to effectively result in a positive outcome for our community? Um, as a district council, um, we need to enforce the regional policy statement and it would be good to get the views from the regional council about how these SNAs are effectively going to meet the regional policy statement, how that's different to the current mapped protected natural areas from DOC mm -hmm. that we've had for a, a really long time. Sure. Um, and, um, and from regional council, uh, let's just say if the minister decides for this national policy statement to go away or to be changed in some way that um, it's not going to be as imposing on our community, um, what will that mean from the regional council about the minimum requirements for our district plan? So I think just to pick up on um, part of Andrew's question as well is um, the question you had was around it almost like this SNAs remove uh, people's land rights. So I just wanted to clarify what land rights does an SNA actually um, change or take away from a land owner? I don't want to bore everybody with my <laughs> talking, so um, I might pass. <laughs> You're allowed to pass, <laughs> really. Um, so it's, it's more just about um, putting, I guess, restrictions around vegetation clearance. Um, so at the moment there's a process to go through if you're doing um, large amounts of vegetation clearance, uh, resource consent process, um, and it's proposed that it's um, a more stringent rule framework around vegetation clearance in SNAs. Um, so yeah, as Greg was saying, that kind of is fed down from um, directives we're following in the RPS and potentially in the NPS if it lands. But what I'm also hearing from your question, Andrew Kritz, is that it, it maybe comes from something you've said as well, that there are a lot of protections in place already. Um, so at the heart of it, are people objecting to the concept of doing things to make sure they can protect these um, significant natural areas without that SNA tag on it? But... Yeah, well, I, I guess, you know, from our perspective, one of the, the big issues that we have with this is that a lot of our modern land is undeveloped land. And it's been undeveloped for a whole lot of reasons why it's uh, not developed. Yeah. And so what this does is ensures that that land will never be developed. Um, you know, if, we've, if you've cleared your land previously and you've got high producing farms and, and areas, you're, you're, you've escaped the SNA. 
but uh, a lot of our Māori land is, uh, is just captured humongously mm -hmm. and disproportionately compared to land that's been utilised previously. So that's a massive issue for us. Um, we're coming into a time where getting um, assets back, which will actually be working for us, and we're coming to a time of um, economic development where a lot of our trusts are, are able to invest. And this is, will be another barrier um, for our land, again, not being developed for our own use. Um, and, but having the, the right to have those decisions to, um, to uh, develop our lands, um, to move our people forward. And, that, and our lands, are particularly in our little areas, um, in our small uh, regional areas, little towns, um, all our farm and live away for work. And why aren't they at home? Because there's no, there's no work at home. We're coming into a time that we can start getting leveraging some of our assets to, to get some of those uh, initiatives going. And again, this is putting one of us to stymie that development again. So am I right in understanding that what you're really asking for is a much broader conversation around the um, policies being created, establishing a way for increasing the use and the availability of Māori land for its owners and the beneficiaries. Yeah, and, under the, and for those owners to make those decisions themselves, I've been kaitiaki for this for a lot of time, and, and, and realistically, a lot of that land won't be developed. But there are certain areas within those um, blocks of land that could be developed uh, for the benefit of our people, and, and they should be allowed to be developed. And um, we would like to have those... Uh, the right to make those decisions on our, on our land. And at the heart of all of this is um, our communities because um, our kudas, our marae, our communities rely on having people there and in those communities. And again, this is another barrier for our people and our very culture and existence in those areas to, to continue. So perhaps I can um, use this moment to move to your questions, Francis. Um, I think I'll put it like start the questions like this. Imagine waking up and finding your um, funeral is on a map and everybody was able to see it and most of it's um, being shaded. And I think that was um, quite a difficult thing for um, many of our hubbing to see. Was the first um, port of call we had with this SNA was to see our land mapped up. And so there was some there was some discussion and um, Sailor has been in touch with you. There was some discussion as to how could it be that you were that far down the track without actually having spoken with us. So, um, so the thing that's brought to the front, as, as you all know, now we have just spent the last 10 years, 20 years going through the hearings process with the Waitangi, Waitangi Tribunal, so that um, whole sense of what's going on with whenua, what has go on, gone on with whenua, is still sitting large on, uh, on our minds. And then this SNA comes in. So the question was sort of sitting around, you know, tangata whenua rights and tangata tiriti rights, and where in your um, considerations as to how you might lead out to this process of mapping us up or deciding what we can do or can't do on our whenua, we wanted to, uh, the question was to say, well, what, what have you done to ensure that relationship, unless it's not a real thing, is actually able to be um, such that we can see that the table come to our I had to talk, and I know some people have come to Wainui and spoken to us about it, but um, you have no rights over our whenua. Basically, is what we're saying. It's, that's our right to determine whether we um, do develop them into some kind of economic model or not. That still remains our right. Sure. Um, so, so SNA actually takes uh, it looking like in the way in which it has been pitched on your online um, information sheets. It's looking like we're going to have to come back and ask you, can we please chop this tree down? We please build a house. And you know, there's, there are issues for us to do that. This is just going to put more costs and take us further away from our ability to live at home in the way that we want to. And no one has that right. So I, it was a kind of compliance thing um, for the. Um, for the, for the council, I guess, and to ensure that the process was tiriti and he waka putanga compliant. I imagine we all know what that could mean if it's not compliant. So there are some things that have, been, that have happened in this space and you're non-compliant with te tiriti. And so you want to um, say, well, if you're non-compliant with it, how are you going to fix up that non-compliance? That's the question of, we know you're non-compliant. 
Um, and then the other question was around, do you understand the nature, or does the council understand the nature of Māori land ownership? Because what happened is we've got an unequal information dissemination. Some people received packages, some people didn't. Um, so we've got a range of um, un imbalance there with who's got information. So we know that whole blocks have been taken out. When you take a whole block out, um, that, that mean, what does that mean? So, so all those questions. So we, we think, are we going to take it back to a, a te treaty compliant space? And I imagine your plan will have something, your, the district plan will you'll have some, something in there that suggests how you go about that. So we think your first port of call is actually not appropriate because you didn't talk to the people on the ground that it affects the most. And not just today, tomorrow, because some of that land still sit in there for a very good reason. And so we're also thinking about our Mokopuna tomorrow as well, and it's not captured up in this. So um, we, and we're actually asking you, I see that I'm down here's Whangaroa uh, Hapu. No, I'm not that. I'm just coming from a Hapu perspective, but many others can speak their own with Ngātou, for example. So just asking you to um, sort out what that looks like and um, how are you going to fix it up? So the question is, how have you given effect to the articles of Te Treaty or Waitangi in your district plan and SNAs? Mm. So let's, um, let's look at that. Perhaps you could answer that. I, I, I do have some comments to make, but I'll just defer to Theresa. She might have some comments or not. Um, I do. I can talk about it oh, initially. Um, I'll talk the second question I can speak to, but I wonder if Sean, you should address the um, technical compliance um, part of it first, and then I'll come to the, the understanding of the land. Yeah, look, look I, I've said in front of 520 people on Wednesday when a lot of the, the council uh, reps here were standing in front of that group that you won't find um, anyone defending SNAs from the district council. They're not ours to defend whether we like them or not. We're, there's a compliance about um, identifying these the Tonga. Uh, and, but notwithstanding that, um, we do need to, for our own sanity, try and make sense out of what's coming down the line. And regardless of where we've actually ended up now in the debate, my earliest thoughts were, well, I, can't get, I can see where this is coming from. It's taken... Um, government decades to catch up with uh, Kaitiakitanga. Uh, at last, people are listening and there's some teeth to that. Um, here's the order coming down to um, identify the Taonga of our country and to put a circle around it, which begins the conversation on how to look after it as a, as a whole. And um, I had thought to myself, so again, this is irrelevant, I suppose, given where we've ended up, but my earliest thoughts were um, that this is agnostic of uh, culture and history. It is a biodiversity map that we can all start conversation with about where is the Taonga, because there's a lot of it that we've never spotted or even agreed to. Let's start by putting some circles on some maps so that we can say that that stand of Kahikatea, that lizard's home, um, this coastal environment, that these are identified. And then let's go out and ask everybody, did we get it right, which is where, where we are right now, and then get lots of feedback on saying, no, I think you, I think you misidentified this place. It's not special. Or, uh, hold on, you missed out this spot. It's very special. And that conversation is what I thought we, we would be having now. It's ancient history, isn't it? Because we're, we've got us really big groundswell of interest and various levels of understanding that are different than mine about uh, what SNAs are supposed to be. But to answer the question, we think about Tariti or Waitangi every second breath in this council. Um, I can explain that in more detail in things nothing to do with a district plan, but there are people sitting in this room who belong to a Tohono unit that was formed out of nothing just to try and get our um, poor level of literacy, cultural liter literacy, up into Ao Māori. And it's a continuous conversation for us. For SNAs, um, the one thing I'd say that um, is obvious already that we got wrong is that we didn't refer to Matauranga Māori when we sat Nick down. 
I'm sort of thinking now that was a bit arrogant or maybe a bit ignorant in that um, there are other people around here, despite a fancy aeroplane with a good camera, who know where the taonga are, and we maybe should have been shoulder to shoulder with a red pen putting lines around the map. So I'd start there. Perhaps that's something we've already apologised for, but the rest of this, I'm looking to be educated as to what what um, what Māori think a better balance might be. Let's think about the RMA yeah. as our foundation document for how you exist and you operate. Section 8 requires you to give effect to Tinsiti or Waitangi. So please tell us and the audience watching how your SNA plan gives effect to Tinsiti or Waitangi. I would say that comes from or Waitangi. I would yeah. say that without Tiriti, uh, oh, no. because sorry, didn't even get to co-write it. Sorry, oh, no, no, let me, let me just come in here as well for our CEO, just, just because just I don't. I, everyone, the RMA also talks about Tonga, you know, and having and um, in terms of the RMA and our section document. I think what we're hearing is that people aren't being offered any. any and that's what we've heard from Andrew. There's only a stint, that's the regulation. There's no financial incentive at all. Essentially, the SNAs are ring fencing biodiversity for public good, and there's no incentive for the landowners, either on Māori land or general title. And people are angry about that because they are the ones that have been kaitaki. They're the ones that have put in the effort to ensure that this biodiversity is there in the first place. So... We've heard, we heard though, Felicity, he's, your, your claimer here referring to the higher orders. Yes. The higher orders have told us, the higher orders. Well, Te Tiriti or Waitangi is the highest order in the country. So how do you, and the way that you've written this, reflect Te Tiriti or Waitangi? Because we, didn't, we weren't a part of the drafting of it. Yes. We weren't a part of the implementation. We have wildlands consultants who did, what's their Matauranga Māori expertise? And how are they Te Tiriti compliant in the way with which they implemented the project in Northland? So let's go to the highest order in our country, which is Te Tiriti on the wall. And how have you given effect to Te Tiriti or Waitangi in the drafting of your district plan in the SNA? If that's a question to me, SNA is not a district council construct, number one. Number one, the, the national policy statement under, just under the RMA is, is essentially the construct of the ministers and central government who aren't here today in front of you, unfortunately, mm -hmm. and you should have been, mm -hmm. because, because and, and this is a frustration of local government across, across the country, but of an area that has such a high level geographically of indigenous biodiversity in a rural land and a Māori land. We, we are supposedly supposed to be resource first. We're not. We are not given any money at all. The landowners are not given any resources. And we have to follow the regional policy statement. The regional council hasn't spoken today, but they said that a, a number of years ago, and we were required to follow that, regardless of what the national policy statement comes into effect. So I would like to hear from the regional council if it, how our current mapping meets that or not in terms of the protected natural resource dog. Can I just, can I, sorry, can we just come back? I'd, I'd just like to, yes, thank yes. you. Just, and Teresa, I think we're going to speak to the second part of the question. Oh, yes, yeah. Um, I, I do just want to say, and to, to answer the, uh, the, um, as an acknowledgement of the first part of the question, to come back to um, the values that um, Andrew identified in his corridor um, in terms of um, giving effect to uh, taking into, to account of Section 8 of RMA, it, is, it should be through the whole plan and it should be um, collaboratively written. And, you know, but going back to our challenge is how do we do that in a context where your even um, even authorities, um, haku groups, um, um, ahau whenua trusts, um, that's the and corporations? Partner, yes. Did you call the hui? I must the memo. Were there any hui? Yeah, we've all Māori together. So we've been asking for hui, and we have done um, recently through um, our 
Royal CO sent letters to the 11 mandated EWI authorities, AFAPU, um, and environmental with environmental plans, um, four or five, I think, Fenua Trusts, to try and engage on um, that level, on the whole plan, and which has got a bit just derailed by ECNAs. I think mm -hmm. that's... We acknowledge the challenge of this, um, both for ourselves um, as an organisation, but also um, for Māori, in the sense that our dis the district plan that um, we're charged with reviewing, this is that's just one thing that Māori have got to deal with. Um, Far North District Council is just one agency that Māori have got to, do, to deal with in whatever capacity. It's hapu, either as whānau, um, as iwi, iwi authority, as marae. The challenge is even greater um, for you, and you know we totally acknowledge that. It's just how we get to the point that we can co-manage, co-collaborate and work together with your limited capacities, which is even you know, more limited than ours. That's kind of so, so if we yeah. can um, if we can just make sure that the conversation continues to be broad and um, rich. I just want to move if I can. Can I just make a statement? It's this is a grounded approach. This doesn't affect people sitting at a table, it affects people living on the land. You're actually taking our rights away from us. And so that's why we're saying Tanaka Fenua means people on the land. It doesn't mean going to a group that are sitting at a table that are representatives of. With a, so, the, um, so the invite goes out. Come back to our whare, come back to our marae and talk to us. It's as simple as that. You know where all the marae are across the north. Why haven't you come to us? Why haven't the consultants come to us? Why do we wake up one morning and it's online that we've been shaded? That's very shady. Very shady. Now, very right. shady. So I'm saying it's affecting us on the ground. It doesn't belong at another level. You need to talk to us on the ground. And that's what I'm saying. Those are our rights. It's done at the Fenua that was agreed, that was signed up to. So just please keep that in mind because I know that you can say it comes from here, there and everywhere, but it affects the people on the ground. So please put that somehow in whatever you develop, come and see us. Go to all the marae because you can find them. And just because it's hard, it doesn't mean you don't do it. So if we think about our hapu or mapuhi, 110 plus hapu, uh, that's not our problem as to how you engage with us. That's who we are. And we are mana te whenua, and we affirm and assert that we have mana whakahaere over our whenua, not council, and we know where our sacred sites are, and we know what our tonga species are. And, um, and you're undermining that ability for us to have mana whakahaere, and it's a control issue. That's the issue, is that you have control through the RMA and then through all of the higher order documents that don't give any effect to Te Tiriti or Waitangi. Okay. So I thank you. Just that, I'm, just, I'm conscious that we've got online people and um, I think what this is, we need to generate as much future talk as we can possibly out of this, but I think you've, you've made your absolute clear point around what's inspected in terms of going forward. So can we just uh, move to Dave and um, ask you to ask your questions? Yep, okay, so it's um, probably as far as we have a slightly different focus to Māori groups, but in many ways it's the same, because I'd, I'd, I'd like to have a team we've got a longer history of our land as you guys have, but we do have a um, tie to our land as well. But um, I guess the first thing I'd say, just in defence of Council actually, which isn't something I do very often, is that when this whole process started, <laughs> they, um, the, the NPS was supposed to be out before they finished. Yeah. So it, they're, they're, it's unfortunate that central governments buggered it up as, as they tend to do, um, because this, this was supposed to come out under the umbrella of the NPS, um, which was going to be in place before the SNAs were released. Um, so I, I think that hasn't really been said. So I think. It seems like your timing's out of whack, but it was actually wasn't. It was central government's pulls it up. I 
guess my fear, I, I spent a bit of time in Wellington representing farmers on the national policy statement side of things, is that what, what Nick's done is essentially just, a, as people have said, identified, and we can argue that it was done the right or wrong way, but he's identified the areas that were, that, are, that for Western science, I guess, have importance. Um, I don't really have faith, I know, as Sean said, that it's not going to be a great deal of impact, I don't know if we're going to do something. What I've seen at the NPS, I don't believe that's the case. I believe it's actually going to impose potentially significant extra additional costs. And one of the things that I saw in one of the um, NPS statements that could have changed since then, probably, had, I don't know, you know, I haven't seen the latest version, but it said you've got the right to continue the land use as you had unless it causes immediate or incremental change to the, um, to the biodiversity of the area. So if you got incremental change, that would mean if you took that to its extreme, and it would no doubt be taken to court by environmental groups, um, an incremental change would mean that if you've got a hill country farm with some bush gullies in it that the cattle have access to, that would be incremental change damage to those gullies as they browsed out their favourite things, you know, suddenly you don't have the right to that anymore, you're causing incremental damage. I'm not saying that, I don't know if that's still in there, but those, those sort of things could come down on top of the SCNOs that exist now. So the SCNOs have been identified. Um, I, I think there's a little bit too broad personally. I think some of the ones that have, I've looked at that people have shown me are I don't really consider them significant, like it's just regenerating toucher or, you know, some of it's manuka and stuff. And there's clearly a line somewhere where it goes from scrub manuka to, um, you know, next stage of regeneration, and that's probably hard to tell without ground inspection. So it's not a great big attack on anyone, but there needs to be a process where, particularly as, as I think that the, the um, MPS is going to impose additional... Um, rules and regulations over and above what council currently wants to impose and you know council's not bullshitting it's just that what they want is what what you know i'm sure i'm sure that's genuine but like once again central government could say hey you know you can't raise an mps or you can't do any additional damage and a lot of what we're doing as farmers is doing some incremental harm if, if, and, and, and if it's a, if it's a the last remaining marine turf, we probably shouldn't be, but if it's a scrubby gully or, or a whole country face with a few scrubby gullies, I'm not sure that's, you know, that's, that's where the issue lies. Um, so I guess I would say that we need to make sure that the SCNAs are actually really significant and we need probably, I think, when you've got 42% of the far north covered, maybe we should cull out some of the, or identify them into tables so we can drop out some of the the less um, significant ones, which are, you know, another health kettle of fish wounds, but, um, and I guess there needs to be a process whereby landowners can have their, or, or Iwi for that matter, can have their blocks looked at without incurring a cost. Because mm -hmm. I've been, you know, when I used to do ecological work, I know what I charged, and it's mm -hmm. not fair to charge my neighbour that lives in a, you know, shipping crate a lot of money to, say whether or not his block of scrub should be S and A or not, you know, it's but yeah, it's just to make Nick might want to say whether he thinks there's a um whether there's a way of a, a, a process where we could at least put into hierarchy of the ones that really are important to those that are perhaps mm -hmm. would be important if they were on the Canterbury Plains, but perhaps are not so important in Northland. Yeah, thanks very much, Dave. Um, just to, just for that first point um, about inspection, I agree that it is obviously costly to go do some site visits and um, it's just not affordable for a lot of people. So um, uh, the first protocol would be using a bleak photography, which has been recently flown, and um, it is really high resolution and nine times out of ten you can actually work out what the time, you know, type and age of vegetation is. So it's a really useful tool. So we'd be using that in the first instance. Um, just in terms of the, um, you know, whether whether sites are significant or not, um, there has been a lot of change in the um, between the two SNA lanes. The original one was you know, 20 years old, so 
there's been a lot of change in vegetation patterns, there's been a lot of um, a lot of regeneration, there's been loss in alluvial, alluvial areas, so there's been clearance and there's been gain, probably a net gain overall. Um, so in the, as part of our desktop mapping, we were including regenerating areas where they, where they were contiguous. Because I would suggest that perhaps if it's only regenerated in the last 20 years, a lot of that's just going to carry on anyway, but some of it may not actually be that significant, it's, it's just scrub. Yeah, but it's what scale you look at. I mean, you could look at that in isolation, but you could also look at it as part of a larger remnant. So that remnant, is, that regenerating vegetation is still buffering and part of that original parent site. So that's that's why it was mapped. I completely understand about smaller, more isolated areas that may have been mapped and they shouldn't have been, um, such as you know, Totoris Dam and, and, and Manuka. But saying that, some of them may still meet other criteria, such as threatened species, or they may have met um, ecological context criteria like stepping stones. Sometimes these small remnants in a, in a pastoral matrix were quite important as stepping stones and, and linkages between... I, I guess, though, that if you got a couple of hectares of even really good, reasonably old bush or, or relatively young bush, there's already rules. I can't go and bowl that over anyway. I just not, <laughs> I'm not sure it needs the next step yeah. of protection not so much because I'm opposed to the protection per se, but once you've got that label on there, you don't know what's going to come in the future. And as I've said, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that central government's not going to, if, maybe not this time, but next time, impose another set of rules. I mean, they've done it with everything else. You get, you get water quality and, and, and everything else. You get the first set of rules in and then you incrementally build on it. And I'm just concerned that if you have too much area put into SNA long term, you just get more and more rules stacked on that. Um, and once, yeah, it's and, and probably it's going to be landowners that potentially where the cost, particularly when they talk about you know, environmental protection or yes, in, in, the, in the NPS again, they're talking about you know um, restoration and enhancement, which you know, when you start talking about that, you're not talking a few bucks, you're talking you know, environmental restoration is a huge, that was in the last draft I saw, words, wording like that. I, it's, it's, I think it's about making sure that you get the very best stuff protected, but maybe not a lot of the peripheral stuff. Just, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we were using a, you know, a set, a set um, a criteria to, yeah, to, I, as, as our sort of lens. Was that from Regional Council, or did you guys? It's based on RPS, yeah. on Appendix 5 of the RPS. So it's not really a criticism of you, it's, it's just, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe regional council needs to relax the criteria. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, was I was just going to indicate that we did, um, we are going to have a break for a cup of tea. Uh, so perhaps, Ben, that will give you the opportunity to prepare and think about what it is that, that you are going to be sharing with the, with the group. And I also would like... Um, when we come back from a cup of tea, perhaps to just ask you a little bit more to um, maybe pick up the conversation around Matauranga Māori and how that could be or could be integrated into the work that you you were doing. So if we could perhaps just take a pause and have that cup of tea, and um, and we'll come back in 15 minutes. And I'm assuming our online people, you can have a cup of tea as well.
to everyone. There's been some fabulous all here while cups of tea have been had and shared. And I'm sorry that we won't be able to share all of that all with you on the online. But thank you. Your questions are coming in, and uh, we'll definitely be getting to those questions. I've had a request to see whether we can, um, if people are happy to continue until four, because there is this really high level of conversation. And the, and the team here say, yes, we'll continue till four. So thank you very much for that. As we went to uh, afternoon tea, a question was put to Ben. And Ben, you've had some time. So. Uh, thank you. Um, so I guess the question was sort of more broadly, and it's been asked a couple of times, is the role of the regional policy statement um, and all of this. Um, so at the top, you know about the RMA, and it talks about the means to protect the challenges of education, etc. It sits there. Um, the RMA also says that the regional council has to set uh, higher level regional objectives and policies uh, for resource management, including uh, indigenous biodiversity. That sets it out, and that's the job of the regional policy statement. So what the regional policy statement um, does is it has um, some policy, and the policy talks about protection of significant Indigenous vegetation and, and, and provides the detail around kind of what that is, what are the particular features, what are the particular things that are significant, and also sets out a bit of a hierarchy around when things are really, really important and you've got to avoid effects, and then coming down the hierarchy where things are a bit less important and you only need to avoid the significant effects. That's uh, part of that is also dictated by the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement, which also sits out here, and that sets some really hard um, lines when it comes to significant Indigenous biodiversity in what's called the coastal environment, which is basically a strip along our coast and includes includes the sea, and that sets the bar of that you should need to avoid adverse effects on significant um, Indigenous biodiversity. So it's a really high bar. So I've got that policy. We've then got um, some criteria, um, that's what's in Appendix uh, 5 of the Regional Policy Statement. And so that sets out uh, in some detail um, what, 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 what is actually significant. It has things like representativeness, um, just rolling through, humility, distinctiveness, etc, etc. It goes into some detail. Now, I guess the, the next question is, well, how, how did it get there and how did the criteria get to be what they are? Because they are probably the most, the, the biggest driver here. So, um, long story short, as, as is the district plan, we go through a, um, the regional policy statement, goes through a process, it's under, under the RMA, which includes um, submissions, hearings, appeals, etc. So, long story short, we ended up, um, the criteria were appealed. So, basically, you're in an environment court situation, so it was around mediation. So, there was a bunch of parties sitting around the table. One party was us, but there was also a whole heap of other parties sitting around the table. Um, and we mediated an agreement on the criteria. Now, those criteria at that time, as I said, were determined by the NZTPS. We also had other regional councils and their RPSs had criteria, so we already knew kind of uh, where things were going with criteria at that time, uh, and, and some case law around it. And at the time, um, the, this biodiversity NPS that we're talking about, there was actually a draft version that was floating around then as well, um, so we took some guidance from that. Um, so yeah, it was a function of sitting around the table and coming up with this mediated agreement um, that's how we made it, those criteria. Um, now, uh, RPS says that uh, gives some direction around uh, when district councils need to implement. Um, it actually says two years from its operative date, which is so 2016. So 2018 was the date that, in theory, it was supposed to have implemented it by. It hasn't happened. Um, and nothing has been done about that from, from us as a council. Um, part, part of what, uh, what happens is that councils, we know district councils, they go through different uh, rotations and planning cycles in terms of updating their plans. Um, so they're not necessarily going to fit within the cycle of meeting that two year time frame. Uh, so obviously for EPNDC, they have the program of putting a place there, um, updating their plan, put the draft now. Um, and so that's 
So we've seen that as a regional council. So we've not been, um, we've accepted that as a process that if that's where you're funding, that's what you're planning is, is, is for. So we're not going to push that issue that you haven't met that requirement for the two year plan. Can I ask who was at the table? Who was at that table? And who was at the table? 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 It's right at the end of the process, so that's not the time where a council is engaging with anyone. That's not it's not developing it right at the end of the process. Um, so we're not going out and, and asking people to come and join. We're not consulting at the end of the process. Um, at the table at the time, um, there were a range of parties. There was the Department of Conservation, uh, Fed Farmers, uh, Forest and Bird, um, and there were um, there were two three EWI groups there as well. Um, at the time. So there's Ngati Wai, um, Te Aupauri, and um, the Ngatui Runa tribe at the time. What year was that? Uh, 2000, I'm going to say 14, 15, okay. around about then. And so in developing your criteria that you got through the mediation process, yep. then um, this is particularly for our audience that's listening, you've developed your criteria and then you, you as councils all engaged wildlands in a, in a region-wide um, project. Did it come from a regional council or was it local government? You know, yeah. No, so the, the, the three district councils contracted wildlands. Mm -hmm. Which is um, a great moment because I also indicated before afternoon tea that we were going to talk to Nick about the brief that Wildlands was given. And, and as, I, as I've understood the conversation so far, just to make sure that you're in the same context as I am, um, your task was simply to take aerial photographs and to, to map these areas. Yeah, yeah that's... that's um Correct in part, yeah. It was a largely a desktop exercise interpreting aerial photography um, and also um, looking at uh, press reports and literature, uh, mainly prepared by the Department of Conservation, um, looking at databases, you know, for um, threatened species um, and um, other reports that wildlife may have done, and then basically compiling that um, and identifying each SNA. And then using the criteria to assess the um, MGCNA. I don't want to. I don't want to sound disrespectful of you at all. But the um, so essentially, you did whatever you are contracted to do by council. Yeah, that's right. So you did we, what we, they we asked. Agreed, we agreed on a scope of works um, prior to the commitments of the uh, project. So in in the future, if you were going to be doing, there was a conversation about whether there was any matoro on the Māori in your. Um, within remit. Uh, um, would I be correct in understanding that in the future, if you were asked to do something along those lines, that would form part of what you did? It's not. It's I think no. I think it would definitely be a conversation we'd have with with the council, with the, with the body whose uh, contract is yeah, for sure. Which brings us nicely to uh, Huhana's questions. Um, so Huhana, would you like to? ask your questions and feel free to ask supplementaries as well. I'm sure that the conversation has helped move some of these ideas. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting looking at how the classification came to be from NRC and then how our um, wildlands consultants were engaged by the local government and the scope with which they engage wildlands, which clearly may not have had any consideration for time of species according to our, our definitions of Mātauranga Māori. Is that right, councils? Are, are we, did we have a Matauranga Māori gap in the contract for Wildlands? I'll say yes. Because um, staff did ask for resources enough to be able to engage you know, properly with the Tangata Whenua, and um, we, we didn't allow the budget in there because um, it was just not the appetite for Matauranga to do so. 
Um, so, <laughs> so I, I want to go back to um, engagement and um, how you made your decision to execute this year um, your SNA consul pre-consultation. Um, so my question for the audience that's listening, and everyone's got it in front of you, 1997, uh, the then Minister for the Environment, Simon Upton, cautioned Farnell's District Council around the way with which you were implementing your district plan around ECNAs and how it could have implications on your relationships with your local people, Māori, non-Māori. Um, so I'm wondering about, so 1997, way back when, I was at uni still, um, John Carter was the MP and at that time and he was throwing stones at FNDC, now he's the Mayor. Um, from 1997 and those portions that you received then, take it forward to 2021, what learnings have you had around engagement and, and, and knowing what good engagement looks like? What, what have you learnt? Because um, your decision to implement the way that you did would demonstrate to the community and to Māori that, that you didn't really learn much from 1997. And that's a retro throwback, 1997. So I'm just wanting to understand, did you learn anything around the portions you were given in 1997? And, and it may not be a question for this table, because, you know, not who was at the table at the time. And then now, so how, how did you plan out your engagement if you were told back in 1997 to watch yourselves? I was alive in 1997, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I wasn't here, but I, was, but I was also engaged in uh, bicultural partnership in different dimensions at the time, and I would be guessing that, um, to throw ourselves on the sword right at the beginning of this again, we, we could have, and still do, starting with this table, um, continue to have this exploration on Mātauranga Māori because there is there is knowledge in the Māori domain that is not necessarily Western scientific knowledge, which uh, is being undercooked, and I hope we've already covered that. But in brief, if I went back to what, what the world was like in 1997, um, this whole thing is um, is respectful of um, Mātauranga Māori. I mean, we learned, we, the rest of Aotearoa, off Māori teachers learned since 1997 that mana whenua have domain over areas of land of the whenua, which are in addition to and in some cases irrespective of the title owners in the grid squares that are chopped up inside that land. And that for the benefit of generations to come, that domain is uh, is real. It involves kaitiakitanga in a way that, regardless of whether you think you own that land of that, that stand of trees because you own this title, that stand of trees belongs to a lot more people than you um, and us. It's uh, for the collective protection. So um, I'm not going to defend these scenarios like I said before. Uh, we just have to do as we're told at this level. But if I try and put myself in the boots of central government, they are trying to provide um, some teeth to that. We're, with something like SNAs, it says, regardless of whether you own the land or not, the preservation of any taonga that's been identified on that land is now a compulsory conversation if you go to redevelop. If you just want to do the same old stuff as you've always done for the last 20 years, and even the same routines, if you've been clearing an area every four years for the last 100 years, then do it in four years' time as well. If you've got a track that needs re-clearing on a regular basis, just keep re-clearing it. Don't fence off anything that's precious that wasn't fenced off before. But what it is saying is that if you go to subdivide this property, there's a compulsory conversation about uh, the toll. And, and so I think that's a, that's a, if you think about it, that's a hell of a long um, distance travel since 1997 that this stuff is now incorporated, not just in our law, but in the way we think, and certainly the way this council has staffed up in its conversation and its Tao Māori perspectives. But we're still short, we're still falling short, Huhana, and I'm really glad you're here making these points. Um, because you know it hurts to hear them out loud. I think there are deficiencies in what we're doing, um, but, but, but a little bit of credit for where we're up to so far. Who should we be having those conversations with? Are you suggesting we should be having them with um, outsiders because that's the 
So, so the, the, the system, just going back to the rights thing again, who should we be having those conversations with if we want to do that? If you want to do what? If we want to make some changes or do something on our land, who should we be having the conversations with ourselves or with outsiders? Our national policy statement has supercharged Final District Council to be that regulatory agent upon our mm -hmm. FEMA. So um, if you want to, is it 50 square metres? If you want to put a shovel in the, in the ground? So uh, five, 500? Um, 50, that is a draft. 50 is really small, so our Tano Mata is 100 metres. Yeah. So I would be breaching SNAs on our whenua by planting the kumara and the banana plants on our whenua. You know, just, you know, no, 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 but what I'm saying is that if I want to clear the scrub down in this place, because there's heaps of scrub and it's SNA, and I wanted to go and uh, replicate our awesome mata from Ngāra Tunua in the back blocks of Pibiwai, I can't. Because I'm going to have to pay for some guy who's an ecological person who may not have any demonstrable knowledge around Mātauranga Māori to pay him to come and tell me I can plant my māra, plant some kumara, maybe grow some, you know, some tomato plants, um, and then I have to apply for a resource consent. <laughs> that is what's so hard for Whenua Māori landowners is that we have been marginalised through colonisation. We've lost so much. Okay, so we've lost so much Whenua. And we've got these little remnant plots around around Taitukiro, and um, those little plots of whenua are, are the spare bits, because all the good stuff is taken, right? Whenua raupati, simple as that. Confiscation taken by acts and omissions of the Crown. Um, and so we, we, we're pretty landless. You know, it's, it's small. It may look nice and big, you know, in parts of Hokianga that have got nice big SNAs across it, but that's all that's left. That's our tribal estate. And, and, and whether your name's on the title or not, like Sean said, um, that's, that's it for our hope. Um, and then to know that um, national government, so this is going back to Labour and um, the coalition agreement and the way that you know, James Shaw's the Associate Minister for the Environment, have now, through the NPS, um, clearly shown no regard. We're really worried about Y262 and the protection of Tonga and who defines what a Tonga is and then who gets to go and complete the classification and assess it. So we're worried about that. Then we're worried about um, Te Tiriti compliance and EBGs are not that group. Um, and then from there, dropping down that through the national policy statement, so this is all directed at central government, um, that local government is now going to be supercharged with the guys who are going to regulate us. Now, I, as, as Mane Te Whenua, I am offended because um, we've only got a tiny little parcel left, you know, our little thousand hectares in Waiotanga, um, a little bit over here in Pipiwai, you know, going up to Matihete here and different parts of Hokianga and Whangawai. But for that little bit that we've got left, surely, surely we can have the freedom to exercise our tino rangatiratanga over those blocks. So, sure. Mahana, can I just, because um, this is a, an awesome opportunity to go, uh, I've heard Sean say, yes, falling on his sword, we need to do better. What would you suggest, or what's a possibility that could happen so that the conversation that clearly needs to be had can continue to be had. So John Carter was the MP at the time in 1997, and he was cautioning, alongside the minister of the time, Farmer District Council to not implement SNAs the way that they were. So my challenge to the councillors sitting around the table is on Friday the 11th of June, you cross the floor and you come over to our side as affected whānau hapu landowners who will hikoi on your office. You come over with us and we challenge Northam Regional Council and we challenge the national policy statement because actually that will do a lot more for your, your recognition of the concerns is by coming over by us and saying, actually, no, we're going to vote it down. We don't agree and we're going to tell Northam Regional Council, back the bus up, Ben. You go back with your regional policy statement because we're going to side with our ratepayers, with our landowners and all of those Fenwa Māori landowners who are worried because we're going to hikoi on you on Friday, 12 o'clock, out here. So we welcome you to come and receive us. But, you know, that would be a really strong statement to show you've heard the voice of your people. You've heard the concerns and now we are going to walk with you to raise these concerns regionally and nationally. What seems to be being said is there's absolute agreement around the need to do something to protect, um, and that's to protect from 
the developers who want to just disregard significant natural areas. There's, <clears throat> there's clearly a need for this conversation to be had. What I'm wondering is, and um, perhaps I could ask you, Sean, what, what, how would you like to engage with mana whenua in the future in terms of conversations that need to be had like this? Can I jump in and speak to that briefly, just to um, cross the point with us. Mm. <laughs> um, I don't think it's, it's interesting some of your commentary. In 1991, there was significant optimism in my Māori that Section 8 and the various other issues of national importance of reference Māori, Tonga, etc. There was quite an optimistic approach with the Māori Bill, which has over the years has um, gone downhill yeah. because it hasn't been implemented. Uh, the, the status of Mataranga Māori, Western science has been the be all and end all for a long time. Slowly we're understanding, others are understanding collectively that Mataranga Māori is a, is a system of observation, analysis and forward planning for protection of resource. And that's something to be valued. And I believe that Western science and Mataranga Māori can okay. work in parallel and very powerful and a very practical sense. In terms of what has to happen in terms of engagement, we both sides of the argument, conversation, central, rather local government and mana whenua need to be resourced, and we had this conversation in the break. We do not have resource to engage with mana whenua in a meaningful way. 240 odd marae. Greg has six people on his team. Uh, what's 245 divided by six? Uh, they're going to be busy for about five years, quite seriously. We need better resourcing, and it can only come from central government. Mm -hmm. um, mana whenua, marae, hapu, need to be resourced in order mm -hmm. to engage in return. And where is that? Where is the capacity mm -hmm. to meaningfully keep up with everything that we're throwing at you? We've got consultation like, what, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very real thing, and a lot of it does come back to resourcing. Mm -hmm. And I'd absolutely believe that's not something that we can reasonably expect local government to fund. If the only way we can get money is, is by taking it out of our own tax pockets, then that's just a... I'll just make a comment to that then. Until it's resourced appropriately, can we be taken off the SMA? Just asking for Māori land to be taken off as an SMA until we get to that stage, or we may never get to that stage because um, Mātauranga Māori sits with the people and it sits with their long time sitting on the land. So I'm just going to put that. I think that would be for us to have us taken off the um, take, taken off the maps and we'll deal with that until funding is made available if that's the issue. I don't think it is or will be issue, but. That's what I would like to take. Well, perhaps we can just come back to Sean um, after you, David, just to let Sean have his point. Um, I, I think, in terms of the way forward, I think um, if I jump straight to the end state that's most desirable, it's a co developed set of unifying rules. It's a co-developed set of rules that we can all play to. And I, I just want to acknowledge um, farming community in this as well. You know, I got a, I won't read you all this letter, but I got this yesterday from uh, a farmer who hasn't given me permission to use it, so I won't name the family, but um, they say our main family farms 450 hectares, of which 139 is native bush and wetlands. All this area has been fenced off for years, a total of 30 kilometres of fencing. Stock exclusion resulted in improved undergrowth and um, uh, in the bush and all the swamps and wetlands have thrived. We have a growing population of North Island brown kiwi on our farm and are actively involved in pest control work to ensure their safety. Their numbers have increased from 50, uh, 250 pairs of kiwi due to our hard work. We've also planted significant areas of enhanced bush and wetlands. All this effort has been put in comes at a considerable personal cost to us. However, we are happy to do this because we are extremely proud of what we have and passionate about preserving it for future generations. I do understand that all the SNAs do need to be identified and acknowledged. However, the way you've gone about it is wrong. So, um, look, Council and uh, mana whenua and farmers and other interest groups are all violently joined up on this. If you only look at the big proportion of us who are aware of the Tonga and trying to do something about it, but what we haven't talked about enough at this table is I'm going to be generous and just call them rascals. There are um, down on Westland, 60% of their land is under SNA at the moment. 
uh, I won't say where else in New Zealand, but we, we are hearing anecdotally at the moment that people are out there actively cutting down native forest stands at the moment before SNA is by uh, And then there's developers who have, they have good motives when it comes to housing policy for New Zealand, which you've got to respect, but there's a certain amount of uh, commercial driver in there as well. And I think what SNAs were clumsily supposed to be about is about them not about everyone who's already trying to look after the place. But how, so look, to come back to your question, Huhana, I, I would love to work together with my elected members and other parties to, to co-develop a set of rules that we can all live by. But I'd, I'd be, I haven't asked my elected members here, so I hope I'm not out of step, but I'd be reluctant to just march to parliament and turn down SNAs until we've got some other way, if not SNAs, to make sure the rascals are not exploiting our taonga on, 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 on... I have a different view to Sean, and I'm, I get a vote at the table. We've got a few people here that do get a vote at the table. Um, and I agree with Huhana. Um, she's made some really valid points. And the regional policy statement, yes, you can be an appellant. Yes, you can join the, the court proceedings. But you're excluded when it comes to that point. That means that these people in the room, Tanya Tupina, were excluded from that discussion and the actual definition that was the result of Appendix 5 of the RPS. The regional council laws that all have a vote, they have the mandate, if they choose to, to change their regional policy statement. As do we as elected members. We get a vote and we can do, as Huhana has highlighted, we can say no. And that means central government will need to stand up in front of this and if we're taken to court, they should stand up and, and actually take ownership and responsibility that they are making up this legislation. This is not a district council construct. This is a central government construct, and we already have protection mechanisms, and this is regulation overload. So what I want to um, also add as a supplementary is around, um, you know, so once you've got your SNA, and uh, you, you, I can't plant the tomato plants in the Kumara as intended on Nana's block behind the house because um, it's going to be 100 metres and I can't afford the resource consent and the ecological report to approve me to do that. I, I, I'd like to explore um, the conservation covenants. So um, when you have an SNA that's designated on your land, just like Ngā Whenua Rāhui and the Kiwi too, you know, you've got your conservation lands there. Um, through applying, and I don't know how much it'll cost, uh, but then you become, you get a rates remission or you, or you don't have to pay rates on those conservation um, covenants. Right. Now, if you, th if you think about rates impact for you um, and looking at both mainstream as well as Māori title lands, I mean, it's hard enough to get rates off most people anyhow, but, um, but if you look at that 280 odd thousand hectares that is going to SNA, mm -hmm. that's quite a significant reduction in rates for you. So how how do you, you know, when, yeah, but there's economic impact for local government too. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just wondering about that because I found that interesting um, that that you get, a, you get out of your rates if you accept the designation of SNAs. Mm -hmm. Then also you think about the... Um, the ability to sell the fenner into the future. So I'm thinking mainstream and Māori hats here. Um, that there could be an um, impact when you go to sell your fenner if you've got a substantial amount of SNA because you're kind of locked up. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Huhana. There's heaps of um, questions and comments in there. But fortunately, uh, some of our online people are asking some of the same questions too. So what I'd like to do now is to move to our um, online uh, questions and um, so perhaps we could just uh, start <coughs> that uh, question. Fabian um, Kameri has asked, what happens to the QE2 covenants when and if SNA comes into legislation? Yes. They, they are maintained. Uh, in so um, uh, it's just two corresponding pieces of management. So there's no effect change to the QUT coming. Okay. I'm just wanting to make sure that our online audience can hear everyone. So perhaps we just keep our voices up. I think you might have to answer this next question too. 
is what about rates relief? This Jane Johnston has asked, what about rate relief? Um, or fencing and planting funds, or paying for pest control? What are those? Maybe Ben can answer that. Fencing, regional council. So I can, I can answer the, the latter parts of that. So the regional council um, has resources to help um, community groups with fencing. Uh, we have what's called the Environment Fund. I think it's up at about 1.5 million at the moment and per year, and that's, that assists with all sorts of um, positive environmental work, fencing, for example. Um, and on the pest front here, we, we've got a, a whole lot of resources in there. So we've got, I think it's close to 50 staff now that are out there working with communities, helping with pest control through many land care groups. Right. So that gives the rates question. Um, yeah, there is opportunities for rates postponement or remission, depending on what type of um, offer of covenant can be agreed between council and that party, and it has monitoring requirements and costs for council as well. So, uh, if I could suggest, there is some some um, offset, but it's um, it's also a heavy bureaucratic cost for council to implement. And when you look at the scale of what we're dealing with, if that was to be multiplied out, it's a massive cost for council um, with some offset, but not a huge um, effect. Potentially, <clears throat> as Johanna was saying, this could be quite a significant economic. Just, just on the, um, the point of, of rates, um, and we earlier really was talking about incentivising, um, you know, these, the remission of rates um, on areas um, could potentially be an incentive uh, for areas that are, are going to be probably retained where they are, up to a point where, say, if it was Māori land, you wanted to develop an area, but, you know, while, you know, we're talking about incentivising um, some sort of way of keeping land in um, SNA, um, some, so maybe have some flexibility around that, could be something worth exploring. And, and that is something in the plan that we have at the moment, they're called other methods. So whilst we have regulate, regulatory approaches, we also have to try to find the right balancing methods to help our community, you know, with meeting the right outcomes. Um, and so we, we actually, we've put our hand up for some um, regarding long-term plan, we'll do it again just in future years to see if we can get a better balance. Um, the feedback that we're getting through this process is very strong and high profile and, and we acknowledge that. Um, it also helps us try to leverage the, the, the full scope of methods to get the right outcomes. Just on that flexibility, I want to make the point that um, removing rates as a condition of um, accepting an SNA I don't think it's correct, uh, like in, in, in a principled way, and that, um, you know, for us, we'd see that as pretty much blankets for your land, yeah. if you like. Yeah. You know, so, um, so to having that flexibility around if you wanted to retain that land within an SNA, within a discussion with that time with the Benwell or, or farmers um, as well, um, that that conversation should be had. Yes, so, um, Nakahu or Nakahu, Fano. Ahu Whenua Trust asked, could Councillor Clendon please repeat the advice he received from James Shaw and Willie Jackson? Sure. Um, in terms of advice received, really what's been publicly stated by Minister Shaw in particular, that we need to tie her a little and um, spend some time listening. Beyond that, there's been no particular advice. Um, our Mayor is actively engaging and just making sure that the two ministers are hearing that we've got a major challenge on our hands and a very legitimate challenge. So um, we haven't received formal advice in any way other than that general comment that maybe put the reins on this for a little while and spend a bit of time listening. Mm. Certainly once if anything substantive we get, we'll obviously get public domain pretty quickly. Quick um, question to Council. Um, with your ecological reports that will be required on us to um, go and dig our marder or put a cabin up on our whenua, um, will you have a list of approved providers that we would we would utilise um, in, in order for us to know that these people are authorised by council to give us those reports? Um, that would be quite cool, like if it did go ahead, because then you know you, you know you've got an authorised group of um, providers. That, that falls exactly into those other methods and approaches. You know, we learn from the feedback that we're receiving, and even 
Um, if you look at the national policy statement, there's a broader set of policies to make sure that you will have the right um, flexibility and opportunity for, for use of Maori land. It's very Western science, though, and um, so I'm wondering around um, Maturanga Maori knowledge of your eco, you know, the ecologists that will come and do those reports for us. Yeah, um, I, if I can suggest through our process right now, it's the type of thing we can build into the policy framework. And it's also identified in the draft national policy statement as a clear um, responsibility. So Asha Jade asks, can I collect seeds for propagation, make tracks, plant trees and collect firewood on my SNA land? <coughs> yes. <laughs> in our draft rule framework, um, there's some rules around um, maintenance of existing activities, including tracks, um, fences, things like that. Uh, as well as that, any existing use of the land will be preserved for existing use rights. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess it's important to note that the rule framework is at a draft stage at the moment. Um, we'll be notifying our district plan at the end of the year. But between now and then, uh, there's some work to be done around making sure that we get the right thresholds, um, having a lot of good conversation with people and making sure that we get the right balance of rules. So Steve should be pleased to hear. He's got a pre-existing track, um, which is in a designated SNA, and his question was, can he clear native growth on and near the track to keep it clear? Yep. So the answer to that is yes. Yep. yep. And um, Asha Jade's uh, question was also, if Māori landowners are using Whenua blocks for commercial use where an SNA has been identified, will they still be able to use that land for a commercial? Yeah, so any existing use um, will be preserved. Um, so if we have commercial forests, fine forests? Uh, they should be the SNAs. They shouldn't be? Well, a fine forest. Sure? What if yeah. they keep walk um, through there? There has some, been. There has some, been. you know, beautiful palmer species just happen to be existing there. Um, yeah. I guess the fauna uh, the hasn't really been incorporated into the into the mapping so far. In so far as it's mapping of indigenous vegetation. Um, so vegetation only, not fauna. Well, I was suggesting that under the NPS, I think if you got kiwi or bats or something yeah. in the forest, then my guess would be that NPS is at high. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> so um, perhaps Nick, you could. Oh. Um, you know, obviously with mobile mobile species like kiwi and, and bats, they can they are often found in exotic um, vegetation. So that that's not covered by SNAs. Um, Here's a car park that has lungwood trees and kuku car hang out there. Yes, Would that be an SNA? <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. Get down to that level. Mm -hmm. but, um, Better look after them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is certainly value in it, exotic vegetation, so we can't discount that. Sorry, David's just leaving. So thank you very much for your participation. So Ramona Radford's question was, to give effect to utility, have you considered Māori landowners, the treaty signatories, partners with the Crown, that a partner would be invited to co-develop. So I think that picks up the point that you, um, both Huhana and Sean, were, were discussing. Is the district plan sets out that you're meant to co-write it with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so that's, I think that's that, that's the strongest point that's been made in the last hour, really, is that co-development is, is the way forward, and not, but not just with uh, Iwi, because there are, there are other outstanding stakeholders. But, you know, it's a risky thing to say, but we thought we were doing that. Um, and obviously we've been told loud and clear that it's not enough. When we go out with our very first cut of what this looks like and we send out 8,000 letters and start going to um, who you that have been called around the district, it is for that, for that uh, co-development. I do see, and I'll say now for the third time, that there was an opportunity missed to sit down under co-development and be go and put the red crayon on the maps uh, together. But the opportunity is certainly not lost because there are several more stage gates of consultation here. Even in December at the end of this year, when we uh, expect to put the proposed district plan out, that is just to initiate yet another stage of feedback from everyone and anyone who disagrees with the, 
the detail of what's been put in. And not to be surprised if it looks different from what you've got. Mm. No, it's meaningful. It's really open to actually really cheap back on that because we already have our own system and it looks like we've been asked to be brought into the system, but so I'm just saying it may not be like how you think it is. Uh, absolutely, Francis. I mean, this is, is a really good point, and this is meaningful consultation. I mean, at the meeting on Wednesday night, uh, NRC um, elected member Marty Robinson stood up and he said, I've got two SNAs on my property. He said, um, one of them is absolutely fair enough. I can see why that would that would be designated. The other one's garbage. It's tobacco plants, tobacco weeds. Well, this is, you know, we're going out to find this stuff out now that is... That is going to cause a change on the map. Nick is ready for it, with his eraser to make some some amendments. And for months, this conversation needs to happen. So Nick will be the man with the pen that decides whether it's an SNA or not in the future. Well, there's an opportunity, <laughs> Hannah. There's an opportunity. Does that decide the? Oh, you're going to come to Pippi Wai or my or something? On the ground, people. Who Hannah would be looking at oblique photography, which is. Who owns the data that you've collected? It's our data, isn't it? Well, a lot of the data is publicly available. Like all the aerial photography is available from LINS, and a lot of the reports which we've got our information from, uh, from are publicly available. So, uh, Farnworth District Council would like to offer them back to the landowners affected? Uh, would you like to send out 8,000 letters with the reports? That would be cool. Um, because many of us don't know how to find it, even though it's on, you know, you say Google, SNA, FNDC, and then you go on your map and put in your address. Many of us don't have that ability to navigate the system. So that would be good comms and engagement, is, you know, particularly for some biggies too, is well, to offer the data back and say this is what it's looking like. Is it any particular data? Was it like records of fauna and flora? I don't know. It depends on what you've defined or what our fauna is. Or perhaps maybe the, way, maybe the way forward on that would be uh, for some further discussion about it sounds like the information is readily available, even though it may not be readily available to particular people, but maybe there's a conversation yeah, people. to be had mm. around making more data. Mm. And I think just picking up on the idea of co-design um, or that sort of collaborative approach to preparing whatever's future, whatever comes in the future, um, I just perhaps just clarify with you, Sean, that there's a huge difference between presenting something for consultation, which is almost a well-prepared end draft, to having ideas come from an initiating process. So um, are you, when you're talking about another round of consultation, are we talking about sitting down with people in this sort of form to collaborate, or are we talking about respond to our document? I think um, the consultation is tricky because we're not quite sure who to, who to talk to to get advice from our partners. I, I recognise that that's, that could be a council problem, but I, I don't know. I think we need to share that problem with, um, with farmers and iwi and, and figure out who it is we're, we're talking to for opinion on your Tangata um, Whenua chapter clearly points out who you need to talk to in terms of Māori, and it says Tangata Whenua. Yeah. And it says Iwi and Hapu. So yep. That's what your own plan says in the Tangata Whenua statement. <laughs> yeah, look, so the, so the ideology of that is outstanding. Um, but I think there's a practical rural people sitting around the table here, so we send out 8,000 metres. Um, We're the biggest iwi in the world. Yeah, no, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we would love advice on how to engage with 110 Napui hapu or 250 hapu if you count all the recognised iwi authorities. Um, with all the appetite in the world, we're not quite sure how to go about that, especially when there are different interpretations within each of those homes, and they won't necessarily agree to each other. Well, so to come back to the beginning, I suppose just in short, um, there is a legitimate approach called a straw man. Um, where you, you put out a rough draft and say, right, here's the first guess, can we rally round that and have the conversation that we all want to be joined up on? It's, it's innocently put, maybe naively put, but it was one way to have a crack. If we were to try and step back before that picture and just go open the question right up and say, hey, what's our time around here? We could be locked up for a you know, decade and um, the statutes prefer something more immediate. 
equally perhaps Francis I can um, just pop it back to you you talked about it might look different mm -hmm. don't be surprised if it looks different mm -hmm. is there a way you can share that that looks different with council at an earlier stage I think the first thing to note is that because we have because we haven't been spoken with, we haven't had talked about it, it's just popped up on the our agenda. That that's the first kind of way of saying this isn't going to work. You need to ask us whether we want to have that or whether it looks like that or even feels like that. And we haven't had that. Um, we haven't had that discussion. Which I said we, we do, you do know how many um, marae there are in the. Um, in the rohi, they are, they could be your first point of call, but to actually slap this on top of us and say we must, because what would you do if we did something? What would we you do if we did clear that piece of bush? Are we then going to be taken to court? So I think the the, the question, we, there's no question we don't we don't want to see our environment degraded any further. But that's our right to determine what that looks like, not somebody else's right. I'm going back to a rights discussion, Kilda, mm -hmm. and um, we have a right to actually, we're, we're actually equal partners. There's no one's over top of us. Um, that's mm -hmm. been made really clear in the, in the Ngāpuhi hearing space. Mm -hmm. So what that needs to be is it needs to be an open and honest conversation about how we protect our environment because embedded in the environment are the people. They need to be protected as well. I mean, we wouldn't be in this place if there were more protections. Um, so that's what I'm saying is you need to go and talk to, you need to come and talk to us and we need to talk about how we can protect these environments because we believe we already are. Mm. Um, so what does that look like? It looks like us sitting down face to face in our houses talking about it. And then from there you go, and it, it, it might take two, it's not going to fit with your timelines, mm -hmm. but it, it will mean long time, long term, we have a relationship that's enduring, where we went together, not one over the top, because you can put the central government and they said we have to do that. That's a top-down approach. What I'm asking for is a ground-up approach, because you, the impact of it is actually on the ground, on the people on the ground. And so for the last little bit of land, we're just protecting that catch so that we get to converse with you so that you don't tell us what to do. Because mm -hmm. um, we have a right, because we've been there that long, so we'll help you get some of those responses I if we want to do it that way. Thanks. Mm -hmm. The council mark assessment we received recently identified exactly that. Mm -hmm. They said that this council does not adequately engage with Mana Whenua. And we take that on the chin. Equally, I mean, our defence, I'd say that maybe they underestimated the challenge of doing that in a, in a meaningful way. Um, whatever the outcome is, any successful outcome is going to require collaboration mm -hmm. and cooperation and partnership, if I dare use that word. A um, good example of what's happening is the Upper Harbour Integrated Harbour Management Group, whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. That's sort of got a bit of um, profile recently. That's actually been around for a very long time. I remember going to a buoy on one of the um, Ngāti Whātua Marae, must be at least 10 years ago where that was emerging. And I just mentioned that because that's how long, that's the timeline. So this, we're not going to resolve this today or next week. Well, we can try, but we won't. Practically, it is a task of years. And initially, it has to be us inviting Mana Whenua in, and equally, um, being invited in by you folk, which obviously you're doing today. Can I so ask a question for, um, for the townies in the room? So I'm a townie. I'm, I'm not rural Māori. Um, and I'm mindful of all of us who pay rates in town, and we don't have any CNA near us, but we've got whakapapas or some federal Māori or wherever. Um, will we become the buffer for the loss of rates? Are you guys going to boost our rates up because um, you're losing rates on all of these CNAs? <laughs> I wonder if we could just reframe the question slightly, because my understanding is that uh, the, this court of has brought to the point where um, there is a lot more conversation and consultation and development, rather than have people answering policy on the fly. That, um, so I'm just that worried about the implications no, I can answer that, the um, because the way rates are set, it's, it's about how you slice the pie. So you reduce the number of people that you're rating, for example, if we're not rating Māori land and if we're not rating farms with SNAs on it, 
we essentially going to rate the smaller pies so people will pay more if, because we're not getting more people um, and in the far north district that's a serious concern um, yeah. and I know that we're looking at local government rent and central government are doing that as well to us so I think they need to keep that in the back of their minds when they're looking at the financial restraints let alone the capability and capacity to deliver on idealistic legislation mm -hmm. when, when you put that into practice on the ground you know, with mana whenua, what is the point of this legislation if it's not realistic? And so and um, many of us don't own homes too and we're renting, so then the landlords will pass on those rates mm -hmm. to the tenant. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the trickle down, the trickle down for all of us townies. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure we've got we've got quite a few more online questions. So, and one of them is, um, where can the exact policy statement for the FNDC um, where can they find that exact policy statement? So I assume they're referring to the regional policy statement, and that's on our website, and, and I think you've got a link on your FNDC website to it. In fact, in the draft digital district plan, that hyperlinks to the regional council regional policy statement. Can we make that explicit on your website so that it shows the district plan and the SNAs and then the regional policy and, and like to the chapters? Because not all of us have time to go sifting through the big plans. If we can be really specific on showing the papa, mm -hmm. perhaps there should, perhaps there should, should be some uh, customer testing to see whether it's useful or effective. Because this has come through a few questions about where do I find various bits of information. Catherine, can I? Yeah, yeah I can. I can speak for that. I can go and come into shop, Catherine, so you can oh, see really. um, So I can do some work on the website page as it stands and we can have a try at making sure that we surface all the relevant documents right at the top so you see them as soon as you land. Can you put it to the Facebook link? Absolutely, yes. we'll, we'll do that and we might, uh, we'll do some testing before it goes out, we'll check it with a few people who um, who, who maybe don't have a good understanding of it, it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. We've spoken as well as the draft. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Uh, and I will make sure that Greg has checked. Can I please highlight from the public um, that I've been to that not everybody has the internet mm -hmm. and um, They've had to stop in at people's places or meet up with me face to face to try and navigate, um, you know, and, and look at it. And it, you know, it might not just be that they don't have internet, internet, but they might not have um, good visual skill, you know, visual ability to um, interact with it on the computer. And I, that is a real hurdle. I'm not sure if we've got any of the um, hard copy. You know, anything hard copy at any of our libraries or um, district services centres because a lot of people are saying we don't. And um, at Wainui, they highlighted that it's not in the prior service centre. So, yeah, we need to address that too. Going on the board for everything. Yeah. Um, and before I go off that, um, I know you've got lots of questions here, but I see nobody's brought up an um, issue around. Um, so, the layer goes on. What happens if. Um, the RPS rules change or our district plan rules change. So, you know, what what use they're allowed to have now could change if either of those change. Sorry. Um, I'll have a bash at that. Um, so there are rules in the operative plan for Indigenous vegetation clearance right now. So in the rural production zone, that's 80% of our district, there's a rule about um, clearing indigenous vegetation that's in a random forest. So that's anything that hasn't been cleared before. Mm -hmm. And you're, as a permitted activity, it's 500 metres square, 22 and a half by 22 and a half metres, over 10 year period. If it has been cleared previously, um, it's, it's a two hectares over 10 year period. So the, the management of vegetation, indigenous vegetation has a broad set of rules in the operative plan right now. So it's not unregulated. In the draft proposed plan, so so we've made available a whole draft district plan so you can see how everything could interrelate to, to, to the rest of the plan. It's an integrated framework and you can basically look at your property and see the relevant rules and policies that apply as a draft whilst we get feedback on individual items. So if that if we were, say, notify the proposed plan tomorrow, those layers, those maps, those rules would have 
legal effect. Um, if there were changes to that information over time, it would be necessary to make a plan change. So that's that's once the, the plan is made operative. So to get to that point, you still have to do, as been mentioned before, the public process of submissions, further submissions, hearings, um, decisions and appeals. So there's multiple steps in getting to that outcome. But once you do have an operative plan, it'll then be um, a plan change process to change elements. Thank you. So um, just a little bit further on, <coughs> quite a few questions about why not just wait till someone needs to apply for a resource consent to do a subdivision? And, and another uh, theme of questioning is, won't this prevent um, or significantly limit residential development on land that's sort of on the fringes with SNAs? So um, perhaps the question really is, um, you know, how do you, how do you enable development, enable use of of land with SNAs on it, but at the same time enable the protection. Can you really have a go at it? Yeah. Um, I guess the first part of that question is um, why not put the onus on applicants to tell us whether they have an SNA? Um, we decided to take a collaborative approach between Fungaray, Kaipara, and our district council to do the mapping of the whole northern region. Um, I guess that raises the information level that we have as a district. Um, if we identify these areas, then it's not piecemeal. Like a, an applicant isn't coming in and saying, I want to build a house or um, plant some veggies or whatever. Um, you know, clear bush. And then they have to get an ecological assessment of their land. So we've taken on board the mapping of SNAs. Um, so that we have that as an information level, um, and yeah. So I think it would be it would be pretty costly if everybody that wanted to come in for vegetation clearance had to get an ecological report done um, on their individual land. But we've we've done the SMA mapping um, for that reason. Uh, the second question about um, limiting residential development. Um, yeah, I think it's really important that we get a balance of our rules to enable growth um, and not restrict what people want to do in the land. I think that's the process we're going through now to make sure that we have those thresholds right. So why is the government providing all of this funding for the development of Maori land and housing and on the other hand they're putting in regulation to provide another layer of bureaucracy mm -hmm. that they'll need to spend more money to get a land use consent and pay an ecologist to prove that they can use their whenua. Um, yeah. I just find it very confusing and maybe the departments and centre government need to talk to each other and not be in silos. Okay, well I'm conscious that our time together is um, fast coming to an end, um, but I think we cannot end without um, acknowledging the many questions that have come in, which all have a similar theme, which is basically, if I can put it in a, uh, in a gen in as neutral way as possible, and this is a question for really the um, council, given what you've been hearing from all the people who are engaged <coughs> in this process, um, how will you be um, representing and backing your community to sort of put a halt on the SMA? Some people have gone a lot further than that. I want to acknowledge that some people are saying, how will you just stop this process? But there is a lot of people asking, how are you going to back your community, demonstrate that you're prepared to enter into this genuine consultation and put a stop to what's happening as I understand the questions right now? Hopefully I've represented all of those questions from so many of you in the um, online group. Thank you. Um, well, I know of a couple communities in our district who are supportive of SMA. They've got very little vegetation, um, very little, um, it's all general title land. Mm -hmm. So I think a report from staff indicating those um, and then just throw out the rest. Now, that's where I'm sitting. <laughs> 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 we need to get some, we need uh, well, can I just, um, can I put it back to you? Plan for for um, a collaborative effort 
in this space. I'm not saying we want the, um, you know, our indigenous flora and fauna to collapse, but we need to do this properly. We need to do this with our treaty partners, with federated partners. They want to be a part of that. And I'm sorry, you know, I don't just the amount of work that our district plan team has had to do on this, but um, this has caused a lot of raru raru in my own communities, and um, we need to do it right. I'd say we, we all have to be careful what we wish for. I recall back in the bad old days, things called um, marginal land schemes. Oh, yeah. well, landowners were paid money to drain that last little wet linden, mm -hmm. cut down that last tree to get another 10 square metres of pasture to grow cows on. We don't want to go there anymore. Mm -hmm. We want, yeah, as I started out, the intention of this is to sound to protect biodiversity, mm -hmm. protect the species and the habitat. How we get there is the big question at the moment. And as I say, again, where I started out to reflecting now, our mayor's intentions to, um, yeah, to bring to the table, we do need to back off a bit on this. We do. We hear it every day, every minute of every day, that no, we have got this right. And uh, so I think you can be assured there's goodwill towards um, getting it right. You know, that means upsetting ruffles for feathers or so be it, because that can be quite fun too sometimes. You have to acknowledge um, that, that there are councils that have implemented or are implementing as well across across the country, so um, maybe their engagement models have worked or not. You know, there's plenty of case studies to learn. Or, yeah, yeah, Waikato's going through, Lower Hutt, you know, so um, just, you know, there, there could be some learnings around engagement generally, um, so that we can look to improve um, for FNDC, knowing that, you know, it's like that. Um, and, and we're currently going down, but we're going to come back up um, with something positive that will reflect um, our, our community's need to protect these spaces, um, but then also how it's the how and who has manawhaka haere from a Māori perspective. And, and maybe it's not competing. The people in the flora and fauna aren't in a competitive space, but what is it? Because you, you can't put them over there and the people over there, they're actually there to talk yes. and So if you take the people out of it, then you, you are going to get stuck. So maybe we're looking at it, we're taking it from a, a perspective where we're competing for those spaces. So just asking to open up on that one as well. I'll just make one point to also that address the elephant not in the room. Um, central government, um, you know, because we're, I mean, we're, you know, we're talking uh, at the bottom and, and the strings are being pulled from up here and we're, we're dangling on the bottom talking to one another. So I just want to make that point too, and certainly focus needs to come back on central government or some sort of central government representation. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think as well it's good to have been here at the table because I think we need to be realistic as a district council and we need to have a conversation with regional council about potential enforcement action and what is the common ground with, with Tana Fenua in the room because we're the messengers when people want to build the house or want to establish the maintenance activity and people aren't sitting at home waiting and reading the paper, well, they better look out for that regional policy statement hearing. Um, so people have lives that they're living, they're wanting to actually get on with doing life and I think if we can come to a reasonable ground, reasonable situation with our regional councillors about what's practical to still enable the protection of our indigenous flora and fauna um, and to allow the use of our whenua and, you know, have farming production. I think that's what the community are telling us, really. Okay. Um, any final from you? Um, no, just to, to, to talk about those comments. I mean, I think to be specific to the many people have asked that question, I think what's on my mind is that... Um, Number one of three is that we continue our elected members, um, supporting our elected members, conversing at the national level about what can be done about A, the timing of this, does it need to go on the timeline that it's on, and B, on a potential adjustment in the national policy statement with its trickle-down implications for how we might alternatively look at, um, look at the work that's been done. Second thing, and this is part of it is to just keep the corridor going on what SNAs, where they came from, what they're supposed to be and what they're not. Because at the end of that hard conversation, if everyone still thinks it's a dumb idea, kids play. But I think there's such a broad range of understandings of what these things are and today's been a really constructive way of starting to help people understand what they are, what they are and what they're not going to restrict and going forward. And the third thing that's a bit harder, but it's probably the most important, is um, ask ourselves what better co-development of one set of rules looks like. 
you know, we put a straw man up of one set of rules and now we're asking for everyone's opinion, but we're hearing loud and clear that something earlier and collective would have been a better approach. So that's a big question mark for us to have a good conversation about. So that's it. Thank you very much. Great. Well, I want to uh, thank our um, online audience. Um, it's a challenge to stay committed to the court at all when you are at home on your computers, but thank you very much. It's um, been a great opportunity to get this information shared across the law here. And so thank you and thank you for the court at all that you're going to be having in your houses and in your offices and in your marae and schools and everywhere else. So thank you. Big thank you to our online audience. And I want to especially thank the fabulous people who've been here in the room. I want to thank the council officials who put this together and done all the mahi to get things uh, to the table and uh, for everyone to be here and to thank individually the aroha, the matauranga and the wairua that you've brought to this hui today. So uh, thank you very much for all of that. And perhaps if I could just ask Ruth to do the closing karakia. And as you do that, Ruth, can we just acknowledge uh, Denise for keeping us all in the waka today? It's social media platforms Ya ta ta ka